about your story this morning? How we can turn graves into gardens. Is that anybody's testimony in this place today? Come on. I wish somebody would give God praise for the way he turned, transitioned, and turned your life around. Come on. Take 15 seconds and give God praise in this house. Come on. Hey, come on. Open up your mouth. Open up your spirit to the ways in which God might be speaking to us this morning. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm glad I came to church today. Come on. No other place I would rather be today than in God's house. And if you are in-house, would you please help me in welcoming again all those watching online. God bless you. From Chrisfield to Bethany online, locally, globally, and around the world, we are so grateful that you have joined us today and you picked a great day to be in church. We are in week two of a series called Amplify. And I hope that you enjoyed the, the message last week about the walls of Jericho. Did you enjoy the start of the series, the trajectory of where God is leading us? And the key word that we focused in on last week was the word together. Somebody say that with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Together. And we talked about the sound that we make when God's people come together. Come on. And we talked about the walls coming down, the, the bondages, the barriers coming down of what happens when God's people come together and we amplify the sound of our greatest purpose and our greatest potential. And now this week in week two, come on, let's continue to make the sound found over in Luke chapter 10. So would you turn with me in God's word to Luke chapter 10 on your mobile devices, on your Bibles. If you don't have either, you can find it on your screen today. And while you are turning there, it's an exciting time in the life of our church. So many things that you're going to be hearing about over the next several weeks. Last week, we talked about a new initiative of us coming together called First Wednesdays. It's going to be starting in October where we're going to have a night of uh, extended worship. We're going to take communion with one another. We're going to preach God's Word, kids' ministry available. That's going to be happening the first Wednesday night of every month this fall. Also, the second thing is small groups. You're going to be hearing a lot about our core classes and small groups over the next two or three weeks. We're going to be having each group represented out in the four-year over the next course in the next several weeks. You're going to be hearing more about that. And then also uh, the last thing is our Back to Church Bash. Y'all know the Back to Church Bash? That's where everybody comes back together. We get in this routine again and we celebrate the fall. We're going to have all kinds of stuff after the 9 and 11 o'clock service for kids and bouncies. And, and uh, I believe every year they also have a dunk tank. And guess who ends up in the dunk tank? So that's coming up September the 17th. You don't want to miss all these great things in the life of the church. And so now today we turn our attention to God's Word. Are you ready? Come on, are you ready for the Word today? We turn our attention to Luke chapter 10 today, starting at verse 25. It says this, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus told him in verse 26, what is written in the law? He said, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. Verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor in reply Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers they stripped him of his clothes they beat him and went away leaving him half dead a priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man he passed by on the other side so to a Levite when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. 
Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. I want you to do something that's very uncomfortable today. Can we do something very uncomfortable today? I want you to grab your neighbor's hand. Isn't that strange? Come on, all my introverts just shuddered today. Grab your neighbor's hand. Can you do that? And I want you to look at your neighbor as you grab their hand, and I want you to tell them the title of my message today in your awkwardness right now. I want to tell you, I want you to tell them the title of the message is this. I want to talk to you today about the comfort zone. Tell them it's the com and then ask them this question. Are you uncomfortable yet? Are you uncomfortable yet? Hey, let's make it a bit more awkward and uncomfortable. Go ahead and give your neighbor a hug this morning. Just give him a big hug. Hey, there we give him a big hug. Say, oh, God bless you. This is getting real uncomfortable. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Holy Spirit, for entering this room. Lord, would you help us focus in on your word today? Give me the words to say as only you can do. Be with our time together. Illuminate your word in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, come on, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated in this house today. How many would agree? That was a little awkward. Where are all my, well, I would say where are all my introverts at, but you won't raise your hand anyway. So why don't all my introverts, why don't you just wink at me? Just go ahead and wink at me. You don't have to look at anybody around you. I won't put you on the spot raising your hand. All my introverts, okay, how many are my extroverted introverts? And raise your hand. Yep, that's me. I'm an introvert. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And we get in awkward moments when we do that kind of thing. Like, I'm surprised you still come to church here. After all this, touch your neighbor and tell them, high five your neighbor I hear so many people come through the line after the message and they come up to me at the end and they say, Pastor, that's a great message. I really enjoyed it. I love the worship. But that whole touch your neighbor thing, like that's really pushing me to my limit, Pastor, because I got my comfort zones. Like I got a zone around me that I don't want to go out. I'm an introvert. I don't like when people touch me. I don't like people when sit too close to me in my pew because I have this zone where I'm just like, give me some space, people. It's... It's the comfort zone, and if anybody comes inside of my comfort zone, it's a little awkward for me. How many know what I'm talking about? It's the, it's the comfort zone. We all have comfort zones where when we are pushed out of the comfort zone, it can get real awkward real quick. I'm not just talking about relationships. I'm talking about all facets of life. We have forms of comfort. We have comfort zones with people. We have comfort foods. Anybody got any comfort foods? Come on. Some might be honest about it. Now, when you've got this, you got this hankering for something, when you, you just want to eat that particular thing that brings you pleasure, it brings you a sense of comfort, and you don't want to go outside of that. Anybody have a comfort food? Matter of fact, say your comfort food on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh, I hear it all. Fried chicken, cheeseburgers. I, I've got my own comfort food. There's nothing better than a cheeseburger or a steak. You know, that's, that's or, or, or chicken and dumplings. Come on, let's be honest. Chicken and dumplings right up there, too. There's a, some form of comfort food. I, and I don't, I don't like to go outside my comfort to find comfort. Like, my wife has an expandable palate. She goes to different places to eat, and she'll look at me and say, Don't you want to try something new? No. I'm not trying. I'm staying right in my comfort zone with what gives me comfort. But they have all these different varieties, all these different types of foods. Expand your horizon. I ask them what kind of cheeseburger you got. You got bacon on it? You got fries that come on the side? How big is your steak? I don't go outside of that, y'all, because I've got my comfort zones. Even in experiences of life, some of us are adventurous in spirit. We like to try new things and go new places and get outside of our comfort zone, and many of us don't. Like the thought of crossing the Bay Bridge or the Bay Bridge Tunnel gives you anxiety today because I'd rather stay on the God-blessed peninsula because it's in, my, it's in my comfort zone. 
How many would raise your hand and agree with me if you're not too uncomfortable? That we love comfortability. We love our comfort zones. And the reason why we love our comfort zones is because comfort brings predictability. And predictability is something I can always control. I'm comfortable in things that I can predict, and I'm comfortable inside of things that I can control. And so if I have to expand my horizons outside of these things, and it's outside of my control, it can be awkward, it can be difficult for me to see beyond these zones that I don't like to go outside of. Here is the problem, people. The problem is if you never go outside of your comfort zone, you will never experience growth. Because growth comes outside of your comfort zone. Did you know that there are two particular ways in which God grows you in your life? The first particular way God grows you is through problems. Have you ever noticed a set of pains or problems or circumstances that seem to stretch you? But yet when you get, got on the other side of it, you saw how much God had grown you through the problem and through the difficulty. You became another person all because of the problems you went through. But God doesn't just grow you through problems. God grows you. Here it comes. God grows you through people. But you have to be willing to expand your horizons and to embrace relationships that sometimes don't seem comfortable to you. You have to expand your horizons beyond certain people and certain personalities that you tend to gravitate towards because some of the greatest blessings that God wants to give you through certain relationships, oftentimes we are not the most comfortable with. Did you realize that there are relationships that God wants to bless you through, but you can't see it because they're Republican, because they're Democrat, because they're independent, because they don't look like you, walk like you, talk like you, grew up like you. They're totally different than you. And so because it's outside of your comfort zone, you never have the perspective that they could be people God could be trying to bless you through. And my challenge for the church today is to come out of your comfort zone. It's time to come out of your comfort zone. This is where we find ourselves in Luke chapter 10 today. In Luke chapter 10, it says that an expert of the law stood as Jesus talked to the crowd. And what he did when he stood was to challenge Jesus' teaching. He's trying to cause a debate, a theological debate. Now, when we talk about the expert of the law, I am not talking about a lawyer that we would know. When we talk about an expert of the law, we are talking about really a theologian. We are talking about an expert in the Old Testament religious Jewish law of the day. This guy knew the Jewish law, the, the Old Testament he knew it inside and out. And so when he stands to challenge Jesus, he tries to catch him in a debate. He tries to catch him in his words. And he says this, teacher, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus' answer is as if only Jesus can do. Jesus then takes the question and he turns it on the man. He says, what does the Old Testament law say? In other words, you're the expert. You're the expert of the law. What does the law say? How do you read it? You see what Jesus is doing here? He's actually turning the question on the man. The questioned becomes the questioner. The hunted becomes the hunter. And he turns and shifts it on the man. And the man gives the answer that we expect him to give. He goes back to the Old Testament law and he brings up the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Leviticus. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, then go and do it. But the man is not comfortable with Jesus' answer. 
He's pushing him a little bit further. And he asks the follow-up question and he says this, Jesus, answer me then, who is my neighbor? Oh, won't you be my neighbor? I won't flip my vans on stage today. But I wonder what his intent was when he asked, well, then, who is my neighbor? But what we do really find out what Jesus is digging in on, we find out. Because it's not that this man doesn't want to be a neighbor. It's that he only wants to be a neighbor to certain people. And what we are seeing of what Jesus is doing is Jesus is beginning to enlarge his neighborhood. Jesus is expanding his neighborhood block and saying that blessing comes in ways and from people that you never expected. You know what Jesus is doing? Jesus is pushing him out of his comfort zone. Did you know that some of the Greatest blessings you will ever receive in your life come from people who are not from your block. I'm going to preach today. I'm setting this bad boy up, then you better tuck your toes or run because I'm coming for you. Some of the greatest love that you can rely on in this life come from people who are not from your neighborhood. And when I talk about neighborhood, I'm not talking about the person who lives next door. When I talk about neighborhood, I'm not talking about the person who lives in your development or down the street or even the person who lives in your own zip code. When I start talking about neighborhood, when I'm talking about your neighbor, what I am talking about is particular people God has sent into your life to be a blessing. Did you know your greatest blessing does not come from your own block. It does not come from your own neighborhood. It does not come particularly from the people that you think it would come from. But you have to be willing to step outside of your comfort zone and embrace people that you don't think a blessing could come from. Here's what I'm saying. Sometimes we block our own blessing because we won't come out of our comfort and embrace someone else. A lot of times, we don't embrace people unless they are skin to us or kin to us. If they don't look like me and they're not related to me, they can't be a friend to me. But I came to tell somebody today, you got to step outside of your comfort zone because there are blessings all around you from people that are not from your block. But God has sent all these different types of people to come together to be a blessing. He's pushing you out of your comfort zone to see people and things differently than you ever have before so you would experience your greatest blessing. And then Jesus goes into a parable. Y'all getting anything out of this today? Then Jesus begins to go into this parable called the Good Samaritan. Jesus is driving his point home and says that a man was on his way down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. Notice it wasn't that the man fell, it's that he fell into the wrong hands. Because there are different parts in life where you will fall, but it becomes fatal when you fall into the hands of the wrong people. So he fell into the hands of robbers and notice what they did to him. The Bible says that they stripped him. They wounded him. And then they left him. I mean, if it isn't bad enough to be stripped down, to become vulnerable in front of everybody, then they wound him and beat him, and then they leave him on the side of the road. Now, this story hits home more than we'd like to say, because this is how many of our relationships have become fatal over the years, because many of us have been walking down the road of our relationships when we fell into the hands of people who have stripped us, wounded us, and left us. 
Now, there are some relationships you thought were right, but they ended up being wrong, and you made yourself vulnerable to somebody exposing who you truly were because you thought you were putting your life in the hands of someone that you could trust, but that person, instead of being someone you could trust, had let you down. They took advantage of you. And you know what they did? They stripped you of your self-worth, stripped you of your identity, stripped you of your own value. That's what happens sometimes in wrong relationships. There are many of us who, if you haven't been stripped, you've been wounded. You've been wounded by someone where you stood at an altar one day and you said the vows for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, sickness and in health until death. But you've been devastated by the divorce because you have been wounded by their words. They said things that stuck in you like daggers and dangered and damaged who you are and you feel yourself just in danger of losing life. That's what you feel like today. And there's other of us, other, others of us, if you haven't been stripped and you haven't been, and you haven't been wounded, there are others where your parent walked out on you. They left you when they should have stayed. And now here you are, a grown adult with your own kids, and you're trying to figure out how to be a father because you never had an example. You're trying to figure out what a good mom looks like because you never had a model of a mom at home because they, someone who should have stayed left. And let me tell you what happens oftentimes. Oftentimes in our life when you have been stripped and when you have been wounded and when you have been left, we tend to isolate ourselves into our own places of comfort. We retreat into the cave of our own comfort. And the reason why we do that is, at least if I'm alone, I never have to make myself vulnerable again of getting hurt. At least if I live in isolation and I can stay in my own comfort, I don't have to experience the pain and the difficulty that I'm dealing with that other people left me. I don't want to ever have to go through that again. And so we stay in the confines of our own comfort. We stay in our zones of our own relationships because we don't trust people because of what we have been through. But you are forgetting one small detail that Jesus gave in the Good Samaritan. The Bible says that after the man was stripped and after he was wounded and after he was left, Jesus said that the man was half dead. That tells me if he was half dead, then he was also still half alive. What I'm saying is, sometimes you are looking at your relationships the wrong way. The fact that you are still here, you know what it tells me? You didn't, what you went through did not kill you. It only made you stronger. You're still alive today. You made it through to tell about the difficulty that you went through. Yes, you have been stripped. Yes, you have been wounded. Yes, you have been left. But don't give up on relationships. Don't don't give up on people. You've got to come back, but when you come back, you come back stronger than you were before because you've learned some lessons. You've created a little bit of boundaries of what healthy relationships look like now, and when you come back, you're coming back stronger than the first time that you went down. You're not dead. Come on, somebody. You're still alive. You got to keep coming back. You got to create a come. That's the first thing I want to give you today. I'm going to talk to you about the comeback. It's the comeback. You got to, the Bible says this, you have to strengthen what remains, what is left. You got to strengthen it. What you went through did not kill you. You've just got to begin to strengthen it to establish newer relationships. You can't just give up on people because at certain points they gave up on you you got to keep coming back. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm coming back. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Because what I went through only made me stronger. So here is this man who is left half dead, but he's still half alive. He's been stripped. He's been wounded. He has been left on the side of the road to die. And as the man is on the side of the road, he hears footsteps. Finally, someone has come to help him. 
Now, Jesus uses two particular people right from the onset that the Jewish culture in this day would have known who they were. He talks about the priests and the Levites. These people are well aware of their religious duties. These are highly religious people in the culture. These tend to be the most compassionate people in this society. Yet what Jesus says at this part makes them really uncomfortable. Because he says that both the priest and the Levi, (laughs) did you see it? They pass him by. In other words, they're walking down the road. They look, they leaned in, and they left. They looked, they saw the man had a need in his life, but they kept on moving. They came, they looked, and they left. Listen, y'all. You've got to be careful who meets the criteria of your own comfort. Because there are some relationships that are really familiar. But if they are familiar, but all they do is they, they come, they look, and then they leave, they are not friends to you. Come on, some of you have... A, have been in a great need in your life and you feel like you're half dead and you need some help and you've got some people say, hey, I just want to let you know I, I, you can talk to me if you want to. But, but do you understand that some people, they don't see your need. They got a nose problem. They just came to look and then they're going to leave and then they're going to share your business with everybody. Oh, just let me know if I can help you. I'm half dead. Yes, I need some help. Don't just tell me you can pray for me. I need your prayers, but I need a helping hand too. I got to have both in my life. Because there is a sense of compassion that we all have to have towards other people. And sometimes the greatest compassion we experience comes from the people that we least expect. It's the people we didn't even know about that come help us. It's not that some people that we know try to lack compassion. It's, the, it's just that they are in need of trying to find their own comfort that they never notice anyone else's. And they've got their own need and their own problems that they become fixed on and focused in that they're never able to fix their eyes on anybody else. And you'll never notice anybody else if all you're focused on is your own need. You've got to have a sense of compassion to get outside of your own comfort zone and see other people hurting. And let me tell you what God does when you begin to help other people. When you begin to help other people, you're going to find help yourself. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're going to find it yourself. My father used to say, my father over over here on this corner, hey, Dad, how you doing? He was the pastor for 30-some years here. And his motto was always this. You know what his motto was? If you have a need, go meet a need. If you need love, go give love. If you need grace, go give grace. Because whatever you get, God will return it back to you. But you got to have a heart of compassion, softness to experience the infirmities, the failures, the flaws of people and come to their help to offer not only your prayers, but offer them a helping hand. And that's what we have, that's what we find in the scripture. The man is half dead on the side of the road, and the people that were supposed to be the most predictable passed him by. You know why? Familiar is not always faithful. So as they pass by, he hears the sound of another set of footsteps. Another set of help has come. This is where the story gets really uncomfortable in this cultural context. Because the footsteps he hears are those of a Samaritan. A Samaritan comes, and the Bible says that the Samaritan 
sees the man. He gets down off his donkey. He bandages his wounds. He puts the man on his own private property of the donkey, takes him to an inn and says, take care of the man, and I'll flip the bill. It was a Samaritan who saved him. Now, here's the, here's the thing about the culture in which this scripture comes from, okay? Did you notice the title? If you have your Bibles, look over the title of this parable. Do you see it, see it there? In Luke chapter 10, look at your Bible and it'll say, the parable of the good Samaritan. The good, that's like an oxymoron in this culture. Because in this culture, there was no good Samaritan. There was so much animosity between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. They did not get along. They had beef. They had bad blood between each other. They wanted to have nothing to do with each other. So when you tell somebody in this context about a good Samaritan, they would look at you like you were crazy. They would see, it would make them feel uncomfortable because I don't know a good Samaritan. That doesn't even make sense to me. But yet here in the scripture, we find the savior of this man to be a Samaritan which is strange given the difficulty between the, the two groups. But what we see through Jesus' teaching is he came to change all of it. The most familiar place we see that he changed all of it was John chapter 4. I just talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Where Jesus is with his disciples and he's on a journey. Now the quickest route would be to walk through Samaria. But the disciples think they're walking around Samaria because that's most of the time what they would do. There was such bad blood between both of them. They would walk around instead of walking through. But on this particular day in John chapter 4, Jesus says we have to go through Samaria. It is in Samaria where he sits down at a well with a woman who has an encounter with him and completely changes her life. Jesus says, I'm not going to walk around. I am walking through. Anybody glad the Savior of humanity does that? He does not walk around. He walks He walks through. He walks through through your situations and through your pain and through your dysfunction to come to the very heart of who you are, to sit down on the well of your heart, to have an encounter that you might know Christ. This is who he is. And Jesus comes to change everything at this moment. And here we see Jesus, the unexpected person, comes to an unexpected place and becomes the unexpected blessing to this woman. And now what he is communicating in the book of Luke is the very same thing. It's the most unexpected people who show up at the most unexpected places that experience the most unexpected blessings in the most unexpected ways It's always surprising. Sometimes the people that you think are friends will walk a mile around you. And those you are not comfortable with sometimes will walk a mile for you. It's amazing to me when you are at the crux and the heart of a situation in your life, there are people that you never expected will walk through certain situations instead of around you. They will not pass you by. That's not these types of people. And when you are sitting in a desperate place and you look around, sometimes it's the people you least expected in those places that come the most unexpected blessing in the most unexpected ways right where you are. But we should not be surprised. It is always the unexpected people and the unexpected blessings become the unexpected blessings. But you have to come out outside of your comfort zone to experience it. You've got to have a new set of eyes to see it in a different way because the blessing comes from uncomfortable places, things that were people that you never thought from 
different races than you, different countries than you, different backgrounds than you, different personalities than you. The unexpected person is the unexpected blessing. That's the last thing I want to give you today. I want to talk to you about blessing comes from uncomfortable places. Are y'all getting anything out of this today? The ones who care the most might be the ones that you're not most comfortable with. The people that you least expected are the very same people that extend the greatest amount of compassion. And listen, they are the ones who move you forward in Christ. I did not see that coming. I didn't know it was going to happen that way. And it was the most unexpected ways, but it became the most unexpected blessing that moved me forward in my relationship with Christ. That's why many of you, are you listening to me today? That's why many of you are sitting in this room today. Some of you are sitting in this room today. You never thought you would be in this type of church. You never thought you'd be around these types of people. It is an unexpected place. It's the unexpected people, but it becomes the unexpected blessing that moves you forward today. Can I talk about it today? Everybody, no matter the color of your skins, can identify with this story today. If you're here today and you're African-American, I hear so many of my African-American brothers and sisters that come to this church that say, I don't even know why I'm here. I was driving by. I just pulled off the highway. I came in. This is not traditionally what I go to. It's not traditionally what the music I listen to. I've never been in this type of church. But it was the unexpected place and the unexpected people that became the unexpected blessing. And now I got healed. I got set free. I find help. I saw compassion. It's amazing. And I didn't even see it coming because it was so unexpected. My white brothers and sisters can't agree with me. Traditionally, you came from a traditional church. And you came in as people playing rock and roll music. And the pastor ain't got a robe on. He's got skinny jeans. What's up with this place? He ain't got loafers. He's got vans. I don't understand. This is not what I... And you leave the first time like, I was a little weird. Yeah, it kind of was. You want to go back? Yep, I'm not even sure why. Don't even have a clue. Not what I'm used to. It was the unexpected place and the unexpected people that became the unexpected blessing. Listen, folks, when we get outside of our comfort zone, do you see the culture of the church we can create where we take down barriers and we take territory together in Christ's name and we are able to stand shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters and march forward to advance the kingdom, the unexpected place and the unexpected people become the unexpected blessing. How many know we are a blessing to this city? We are a blessing to the surrounding areas. We are the example that people look to. And they tell me all the time, how in the world does it happen? How in the world is the church at Emmanuel so diverse with different ages and different races? And they are looking for a formula for me to give them, and I simply tell them, it's favor. I don't know. It is the blessing of God where he wanted a movement that looked like the kingdom of God and took his hand and said, 217 Beeglin Park Drive in Salisbury, Maryland. I don't know why he did it. All I know is that he did it, and we are the example. Of unexpected places and unexpected people becoming an unexpected blessing from all cultures from all backgrounds I have people come through the line at certain times in the church who can't even hardly speak English and will have to use the translator on their phone to tell me what they think and they'll say presence of God is here 
presence of God is here. I can't explain it. I don't even know what you're singing about. I graves into God. I don't even know what that means in my native tongue. All I know is the presence of God is here. It's the unexpected place, and the unexpected people become the unexpected blessing. Aren't you glad you are a part of that together? It's you. It's me. It's all of us, and we are advancing the kingdom together. It's together, but don't miss the point of what Jesus is saying. Oh, my goodness. Jesus is saying through the Good Samaritan parable, Jesus is saying, I am the Good Samaritan. I am the unexpected person that came to the unexpected places and became the unexpected blessing for all the people. I am not what they are comfortable with. I am not predictable, but I came to this place to save humanity from their sins. The unexpected person came to the unexpected place and became the unexpected blessing. We can see it. Do you see it in the Samaritan story that he came riding in on his donkey and he saw the man who was hurt? He came came down off his donkey, picked the man up, bandaged his wounds, placed him on his own animal, and took him to the place and flipped his bill. Did you know that's the picture of the gospel story? That Jesus was riding in glory, and he saw a lost humanity in their own sin, but he did not pass us by, but he came down off his donkey in glory, wrapped himself in flesh, came to to this earth and bandage our wounds he went down so we could get up and he paid the full price on the cross that we could be the inheritance the children of God healed set free saved heaven bound we ought to praise God that the unexpected person came to the unexpected place and became the unexpected blessing of why we even get to be healed and set free free and enjoy the favor of God. We ought to stand to our feet and praise God for it even now in this moment. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for the unexpected person who is the Christ came down to the unexpected place in earth and gave his life to be a ransom for many. He came down so we could go up. He bandaged our wounds, paid the price of the penalty of our sin. Man, I feel the presence of God in here today. Mm. This is what we get to enjoy together because of what Christ did on our behalf, stepping out of his own comfort zone. He who had no sin became sin for us so that we might be the righteousness of God. That's the power of the gospel. This is the power of the church. God's spirit living within us. And when we come together from all of our neighborhoods, y'all, from our different blocks, we become a blessing to one another. Don't miss the opportunity to be a part of the church. That's my pull as we close. I talked about it last week. Over the next several weeks, you're going to be hearing about more ways to get involved. Don't just sit in the pew. Be a part of the church. You are missing a blessing because you are unwilling to step outside of your comfort zone. But I'm asking you over the next few weeks, you're going to be hearing promotion. We're going to be talking about in the next few weeks. I'm asking some of you to step outside of your comfort zone and get involved in community because some of the greatest blessing comes from the people that sit in a pew next to you every Sunday, but you won't talk to them. You won't come to anything. You won't participate. You won't get involved. You just come in and out. That's not the church, y'all. See how I got real quiet on that part right there? The church is the people. Are y'all hearing me today? The church is the people. 
The church ain't the platform. The church ain't a performance. The church ain't the preacher. The church is the people. And your greatest blessing comes in the most unexpected places with the most unexpected people. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit that's here today. There's no doubt you are in this room right now. And Lord, um, I just really feel you are calling us forward this fall and you just are setting something up to do something special. And it has been my own personal prayer. You know this, Lord, that I want to see people set free not have the form of religion, but experience the freedom that is in Christ Jesus. That you would break bondages, Lord. That you would set people free from addictions. That you would restore marriages, heal relationships, Lord. Help people deal with things of the past and move forward into the future. That has been my prayer for this fall, but it's going to take for us as a church to step outside of our comfort zones. To experience the blessing of what the community of the church is. So give people strength today that want to stay in that comfort zone. At every campus, the opportunity to get involved some way, some form with different things, whether it be first Wednesdays of coming together and sitting beside someone different than we normally do and engaging in a conversation, whether it's joining a serve team once a month on a Sunday, whether it be a greeter or nursery or kids or parking lot or or whatever the case may be, to get involved, to help us get connected in a, in a small group or a core class, to help us grow in our faith together. Give them the courage this fall to step outside their comfort zones to do that. That we would experience an unexpected blessing in the most unexpected place with the most unexpected people. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Come on, give him praise for what he did in here today. Come on. Well, thank you so much for joining us online at Emmanuel Church. Our hope is that this time of worship and community was encouraging to you and your faith journey today. Maybe you decided to accept Christ for the first time, chose to rededicate your life to Christ, or maybe you just have questions about what it means or what it looks like to begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If any of that is you today, I encourage you to let us know by texting the message E-Decision to the number 77411. So someone from our team can reach out to you, we can answer any questions you have, pray with you, but most importantly, we can begin to walk alongside you in your faith journey today. Also, I want to encourage you today that your consistent giving of your time, of your prayer, and of your resources allows us to provide consistent ministry here online and in person at Emmanuel Church. If you would like to give to Emmanuel today, you can do so in three ways. That first way is you can give online at emmanuelchurch.live. The second way is you can give using the Emmanuel Church app. And the third way is you can mail in or drop off your tithes and offerings to the address that is on your screen today. Thanks again for joining us online at Emmanuel Church and being a part of the EFAM community. I hope you have a great week.